morning, good morning all. Uh, we, uh, we are now starting the fourth session of our media training, uh, promoting a positive image of migrants and recognizing their contribution to development in the SADC region. And uh, today we're going to have an open discussion on key media campaign messages on migrant workers related to policy, legislation, or migration practices and data. So uh, uh, today we're going to start with, uh, with a brief presentation from, from Phil, and after we're going to move on to the, uh, to the discussion that are going to, uh, we're going to have here uh, Vincent and Charles for the discussions, and uh, Makung is going to help us with the facilitation. So uh, with that, I give the floor to Phil, who is going to, uh, to uh, he, who has a presentation uh, for us. So Phil, you have the floor. Oh, uh, you are, you are uh, muted. I was still. I just mo muted myself. Thanks. Uh, thanks very much. I was on the on the. Well, I did the other way around. Thanks. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Fernando. Um, good morning, uh, all participants. Uh, great that that you are available this uh, this morning. Uh, and I see, at least on my screen, that uh, uh, most people have muted their uh, microphones. Please, uh, please do so. Uh, you for sure will have an opportunity to speak uh, shortly uh, because the, the idea of the session this morning is that it will be more of an, of an open discussion and less of uh, a series of presentations. So we really hope um, that we can have some, some discussion about how to bring across key messages about migrants, about migrant workers, in the in the media and what are the, the issues in that uh, in that regard and what is from an institutional point of view and and from my side from the ILO point of, of view the the starting point um, so we will raise some uh, some questions uh, and we will start with an, uh, a bit of information um, to get the the discussion going uh, for that purpose I would like to share my screen uh, Fernando I don't know if I have uh, the authority to do so. Are, are you being able to do that? Uh, it seems so. Yeah, we can see our screen, uh, Phil. You can see my screen? Okay. Yes. So uh, you, you can just go into, into presentation mode so uh, we, can, we can see it bigger. Okay. There we go. Yes, now we can see. Thank you. Thanks, Fernando. So what we will try to do, what I will be starting with, is promoting and an, an, an how to promote a positive image of migrants and how to, to recognize uh, their contribution to development in the, in the SADC region. Um, and how to, to also how to do that in, an, uh, in a media context. So I would like to do three things, but uh, I will keep it all uh, brief, very brief. I will, I will do an uh, introduction, a more general introduction to, uh, to labor migration of, an, of a few minutes. And then I will uh, go into the ILO's approach for the protection of migrant workers. Uh, but I, I will do that in, in general terms. So I will not go into too much uh, detail at, at, at this stage, mainly so as to, to give uh, you all an, an, a chance to respond and uh, not to be bogged down too much in, an, uh, in a presentation. Um, and then I will go to some of the, the key media messages on uh, migrant workers or at least where, where I think, you know, you could put some emphasis in terms of these, uh, of these messages. So this is the plan for, uh, for this morning. Uh, as I said, I, I won't take too much of your time. And 
in the for the presentation. And in the meantime, when I'm going, when I'm uh, presenting, just give it some thought yourself as well. You know, if you if you look at the presentation, what would be the challenge for you to bring this type of, of material in uh, yeah. PR? You know, what will be the challenges if you bring across some of the messages uh, about, about migrants and migrant workers in the in the media? So don't just look at the, in the, 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 the presentation as in terms of information. Ah, this may be interesting or this may not be interesting. But you know, if you want to talk about this type of issues in the media, what are your <laughs> challenges? And this is what we would like to, to hear. And this is what we would like to, uh, to talk about. And not just about the, the content of the presentation as, as such. So starting a little bit with the context of uh, uh, labor migration and why we are talking about uh, labor migration at all, um, the, the number of international migrants is updated on an annual basis by the uh, uh, United Nations uh, Department of Economic and Social Affairs. And what we have seen for a number of years now is that there is a steady growth in the number of migrant workers. And there is also some increase in the proportion of uh, migrant workers around the world. Now, it is always difficult to know what is happening in the, in the future. And uh, even the best experts can be wrong. But the consensus view at the moment, I believe, is that the number of international migrants is continuing to grow in the near future. And the, even the proportion of migrants among the population may well be growing uh, for a while. There's a number of, uh, of reasons for that. I put them at the bottom of the, of the screen, screen here. Um, there continue to be large discrepancies in terms of income around the world. Uh, there, is, there continues to be a lot of income inequality uh, between countries and also within uh, countries. Uh, so migration at the national level will be com continuing to, to be important uh, as well, not only in SADC, but also in, uh, in many other parts of the, of the world. But just focusing on international migration, what, what we will be doing this, uh, this morning is you, you continue to see a lot of inequality between countries, which is one uh, major engine of, uh, of international migration globally. But there are other reasons as well. There are differences in demographic profiles between countries. Uh, there is increasing communication. Think of the, the, the accessibility of the, of the internet around the the world. Uh, there is climate change, which increasingly become a, become, has become an, 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 a motor of, uh, of migration, people being forcibly, forcibly uh, displaced. There is the effects of, uh, of COVID, which uh, earlier this year led to much forced return of migrant workers from various parts of the world to their, uh, their country of origin. But at some point, these flows can be expected to reverse uh, again. So people will again be migrated to their countries of destination, perhaps the same countries where they were before the, the pandemic uh, started. In terms of migrant workers, the ILO released uh, new estimates in, in June of this, uh, of this year. And we stand uh, in 2019, we stood at some 160 million uh, migrant workers. And again, we would expect this number to grow in the, in the near future. So what I'm saying is we, have, we are looking at a growing phenomenon, uh, which is growing in importance in terms of numbers. It is also uh, rising on political uh, agendas. Um, there are quite a few analysts that think migration will be the topic of concern for many policymakers in the uh, years to come, and that is partly, I think, due to the neglect in the in the in the past. And uh, policymakers increasingly realize that migration is not something that is that is going away. It is not going away. Uh, not only because there are continue to be uh, issues such as inequality, but also because there is simply development. Uh, people have opportunities, people have more information. Uh, at the bottom 
of the income distribution. Some people have, are getting more uh, means, which also means that uh, uh, in a number of cases, they see opportunities elsewhere and have actually opportunities to, to travel because at least they have some resources that they can use for that, uh, that purpose. That by way of introduction on the issue of migration, labor migration in, uh, um, in particular. Um, I've already indicated uh, that the, the large majority of migrants move in search of employment and uh, better wages. Uh, a large part of migration is, is, is inherently intrinsically linked with the world of work, as we uh, like to call it, uh, the world of work in terms of, of governments, in terms of ministries of labor and other ministries that are uh, focusing on, uh, on migration, including home affairs, but often also uh, planning, and of course, workers and employers organization. And these organizations are often, you know, keeping a keen eye on migration uh, as well for various reasons. Now, the overall approach of the ILO is to seek policies that maximize the benefits of labor migration. It is not that the approach of the ILO, or I think of any for that matter, is the more migration, the better it is, or the less migration, the better it is. That is not the point. Now, I think the point of international agencies is to, that you know, if there is migration and migration is, an, uh, is effective, there is labor migration, we want to do that in a regular, in an organized way. You know? And for the ILO, it is of course important to keep an eye on labor markets and to say, you know, it would be good if labor migration takes place in uh, line with labor market needs and these labor market needs can be captured in terms of information systems in terms of statistics but also uh, in terms of you know, what are employers organizations thinking about the need for migrant workers and what do unions think about the position of both uh, migrant and non-migrant workers in their uh, labor markets from the ILO point of view, we bring together you know, governments of 187 member states at, uh, at the moment, which is, is virtually all countries in the, in the world, um, and representatives of uh, employers and workers organizations. And they come together each year in a uh, uh, labor, international uh, labor conference. And migration uh, is regularly on the agenda of this uh, conference in terms of a new report, in terms of a new survey, in terms of new numbers, including the number of migrant workers that I, uh, I just mentioned. Um, and it generates a lot of discussion, partly because it is growing, a growing phenomenon, and partly because um, the position of migrant workers is often a vulnerable uh, position. And that brings me to the issue of you know, the, the, the main approach of the, of the ILO, and that is to offer, to present uh, international labor standards, both for uh, migrant workers and for non-migrant workers. Now, what the ILO is promoting is an, an, a rights-based approach that is approach that emphasizes the rights of workers. And these are often minimum rights, minimum rights as expressed in international labor standards. And the international labor standards in principle apply to all workers. One of the key messages the ILO is trying to bring across with regard to migrant workers is migrant workers are just like all other workers and international labor standards should apply to migrant workers just like they apply to other workers. Just because a worker is a migrant worker does not you know, give any, oh, a minimum wage does not apply to this uh, uh, worker, perhaps because it is more difficult for this migrant worker 
to argue with the employer if he or she is not receiving the minimum wage. And often the, the position of a migrant worker is more vulnerable than of a non-migrant worker because it is a migrant uh, worker. He or she may not know the channels, what to do in, an, uh, in a foreign country. Uh, the, uh, without the job, you know, it may be difficult uh, for the migrant worker to, to find a way of living. He or she may lack the networks uh, to uh, continue you know, uh, uh, securing an, an income. Uh, and often migrant workers are in um, low-scale positions with a, a, a limited bargaining position. You know, if you talk about more skilled workers, and some migrant workers are very skilled as, uh, as well, but especially at the bottom of the skills uh, spectrum, uh, workers are often vulnerable for exploitation because they can, from the point of uh, uh, view of employers, easily be replaced. And that risk is particularly present for migrant workers. And that is you know, one of the reasons why migration and labor migration has been featuring on the ILO agenda basically since the inception of the uh, organization. Uh, it is already mentioned in the constitution of the, uh, of the ILO. So there is a number of reasons, and I, I showed that actually last week in terms of some numbers uh, as well, and if, if needed, I can, can present these numbers again in some, uh, some slides, but it is straightforward to show that migrant workers are often in a more vulnerable position than uh, non-migrant workers, which is one of the reasons you know, that we think also in terms of, of, of media coverage, you know, it, it serves a purpose to at least make sure that migrant workers face a level play of playing field. They are not put at a disadvantage in comparison with non-migrant workers, and that includes in the, in the media messaging. So do not start you know, that is, I think, important for the ILO uh, as well. Uh, do not start from a position that, oh, uh, migrants are the cause of this problem or that problem. Start from a position to say, okay, a migrant worker is an, an worker like any other worker. If you think, you know, that there is a reason to scapegoat, to say, ah, migrant worker is a cause of this problem or that problem, check the evidence, where is it coming from? You know, before just copying what someone else is, uh, is possibly saying. So for the ILO, uh, labor standards are an, a major starting point, and there is a number of, uh, of documents um, that I highlighted in the, in the presentation. The presentation will be, sh be shared. This is uh, information on these issues is readily available on the, on the ILO uh, website, and the uh, presentation includes the, the web links on international labor standards on the Fair Make Migration Agenda from the ILO, which is an, uh, an overview of issues that are in particular important for uh, migrant workers. There are also some labor standards, by the way, particularly focused on uh, migrant workers, but they uh, should be seen as focusing on issues that are of particular importance. It is not that other labor standards do not apply to, uh, to migrant workers. There's the decent work uh, agenda, which also lists issues that are important for all workers, including um, migrant workers. So the ILO's approach basically is uh, seeking to level the, play of the playing field between migrant workers and non-migrant workers and making sure migrant workers are not being put at a disadvantage in comparison with non-migrant workers. Um, I think I covered um, most of what is on this slide uh, already. I, I would like to just highlight the very first uh, issue that in practice, uh, migrant workers often do not benefit from full equal uh, treatment. In practice, there are often issues in one way or another, uh, which is another reason you know, to, to use also media uh, messages to make sure there is more of an 
level playing field. One reason for this can be you know, that migrant workers are often not fully represented, not to the same extent as non-migrant workers in uh, trade unions. Uh, often formally this is allowed, but in practice it is more difficult to get uh, full similar to a non-migrant worker in a uh, uh, trade union. And some uh, key messages that I would like to highlight in particular, uh, in the context of COVID, um, one of the messages that we have tried to bring uh, across is that migrant workers should be included in national uh, policy responses. Now, what I mentioned before, from an ILO point of view, the uh, international labor standards aim you know, try to level the, the, the playing field in all areas of the labor uh, market. And COVID is just, in that sense, another uh, dimension of the, of the labor market where we say, you know, basically migrant workers should be treated in the same way as, uh, as non-migrant workers. Uh, obviously, if you think, and in many countries are in the middle of, an, uh, of a vaccination campaign at, uh, at the moment, it, it also makes uh, sense from a health point of view, and it also makes sense from an economic point of view. If you exclude certain parts of the population from vaccination, you are obviously shooting in your own foot uh, that you, 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 uh, you increase the risk for the remainder of the population as well, because part of the population is not vaccinated. The more people are vaccinated, the better it uh, is for a country and for a nation whether these, these people are, are migrants or uh, they are not uh, migrants. South Africa, um, this was two or three months uh, ago, uh, initially uh, sent some from, this, this, this was information coming from, from official uh, government uh, sources. Initially, there were some, at least that was claimed in the, in the media, uh, initially was reluctant to uh, vaccinate in particular non-documented uh, migrants. But uh, pretty soon thereafter, within days, um, there was an, another type of messages in the media uh, that was basically saying, no, we should try to vaccinate uh, everybody. And I think to the best of my knowledge, that is also at this moment, uh, the, uh, the official policy. It is the official policy. I saw the confirmation of, uh, of that. So the country is trying to vaccinate everybody. And this is then with regard to vaccination, but you can have the same argument with regard to support to uh, migrant workers uh, if they are particularly hit by the, the pandemic. Uh, there is generally no good economic reason to exclude certain uh, groups of the population, be it migrants or any other group, from a national policy uh, response. Um, the need to highlight the positive impact of, uh, of immigration in terms of growth, employment, public finance. I highlighted some of the conclusions of, uh, of recent re research last week. You know, which basically show that it is it is difficult to see how migration would harm economic growth in a in a country, and there are good economic reasons uh, for that. Nevertheless, you know, the starting point in in much media coverage is the other way around. Uh, in the media, you often see you know that ah, migrants are a threat, a threat in one way or another. You know they. Uh, the risk for the native population, the, the non-migrant population, is um, that uh, migrant workers will take the jobs of the non-migrants. The research time and again shows that that risk is very limited, and often it is the other way around. You know that migrant workers are actually creating jobs for non-migrant workers, and this has been repeatedly shown for. The, the most important country of destination in the, in the Sadiq region, which is uh, South Africa, 
It has been shown by the OECD, it has been shown by the World Bank, it has been shown by the, uh, by the ILO, it is, it is not new. And as I said uh, uh, last week, that doesn't mean you know, that uh, there cannot be competition in a certain uh, uh, location between migrant workers and non-migrant workers, but it is not the overall picture. The overall picture on, with regard to, to uh, the economic effects of migrant workers is generally positive. The need to uh, uh, consider uh, international labor standards, uh, I already mentioned, you know, labor standards apply in principle to both uh, migrant and non-migrant workers. And of course, if uh, standards are in practice not applied to migrant workers, you get very negative uh, economic and social effects. You, know, you, you get negative effects in terms of ex exploitation of people uh, if a minimum wage is not applied to uh, uh, a migrant worker. You know, it is the migrant worker who is suffering, but it is also the non-migrant workers who are suffering because then they risk being out, out competed by a migrant worker on basically, you know, uh, by breaking the law, uh, because this minimum wage is then in practice not, uh, not applied. And this is not clearly the, 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 the fault of the migrant worker himself. You know, surely the migrant worker, him or herself, would prefer a minimum wage above an, an, a wage that is below the, the minimum wage. So if that is happening, there is another situation, there is a situation in which certain standards are not being enforced and they should be enforced. And I think the enforcement of international labor standards, particularly in the African context, is in, in extremely uh, important. Um, another point to uh, highlight, I think, um, and I'm mentioning here uh, because of the, the, the increasing number of countries in SADC that are in the process of formulating labor migration policies, migration policies, but also labor migration policies, which is an international commitment in the context of, uh, of SADC, also in the context of the African Union. And we can expect you know, that this will generate uh, more media coverage in the next couple of, uh, of years. And I think it is important in that, in that context to, to provide some attention to these, uh, these policies, which often provide a, a framework for the issue of uh, labor migration. And that framework, uh, we believe in particular from the ILO side, should be in line with international commitments. So national labor migration policies should be in line with what has been agreed upon in, uh, in SADC and what has been agreed upon in the context of the uh, Africa Union. And what we, what we uh, see at times is that there is quite a gap between the knowledge and the understanding which exists at the international level, in particular at the level of SADC, uh, and what exists at the national level and what is reported in the, in the media. And I think uh, to, to end my, uh, my presentation, you can obviously, you know, uh, not only during this, uh, this training, but also following this, uh, this training course at any time, approach any uh, of the ILO colleagues, in, including myself, if you have any questions with regards to the national or international commitments uh, that you could possibly reference uh, in the, the media coverage. So let me stop here in terms of the, uh, the presentation. As I said earlier, I do not want to take all the time in going into too much uh, detail. What we would like to hear from you uh, this morning and the facilitators uh, will give the signal when you can, you can start firing your, uh, your question is, is basically, you know, if you hear a presentation like this, what I've just, uh, just said, you know, a number of points, with regard to the economic contribution of migrants, with regard to the labor market position of migrants, with regard to the growth 
of labor migration with regard to the applicability of labor standards to, to uh, migrant workers. If you hear, hear this, we would like to know what are the challenges for you to uh, deal with these matters in uh, the media, how to write about it, uh, how to, 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 to bring these messages across, what are sort of the issues that are important uh, for you and, and in what way can we help uh, to address these uh, the issues. Thank you very, uh, very much. Let me hand back to um, Fernando, I think and see uh, what the next uh, the next step is. Perhaps one of the colleagues from uh, IOM. Thank you. Thank you very much, Phil, uh, for highlighting these important key messages. Uh, and now we're we're starting our our open discussion. So we're going to use the chat box for that. Uh, but sorry, also Fernando. have the possibility. Of, oh, sorry. Um, I think before we go into the question and answer. And the participants here can start thinking about it, but we want to give IOM, who is our um, implementing partner agency in the project, who also deals with labor migration and we work um, in close collaboration with them, to also give um, some of the inputs and highlight some of um, the areas that IOM, um, as a key partner in the STEM project as well, focuses on and what their take on the key messages regarding migrant workers is. And then we'll move on to um, the, the, the question and answer sessions. So I think the participants now, they can just start thinking and start writing in the chat box. Um, today, they can also just raise their hand and we'll just give them the floor to, um, to speak or raise their questions verbally if they don't wanna use the chat option. But I think we, we can now go to Abibo Ngandu, who is um, the uh, communication, regional um, media and communications officer for the International Organization uh, on Migration, IOM. So I think I'll just give him the floor, Fernando, and then we can perfect, go back. Perfect, perfect. Um, thank you, thank you, Makongo. Right. Thank you so much, Fernando. Um, Abibo, um, thank you so much, Theo. That was a very insightful uh, presentation. Um, a lot of questions already coming up in my mind, a lot of things to discuss on. So now I'll just um, give Abibo the floor and then we will come back um, to discuss both the inputs raised by Theo and Abibo after his short input. Thank you so much. Over to you, Abibo. Thank you very much, Makungu. Thank you very much, Fernando and, and uh, Theo as well. And uh, good morning to everyone. Uh, I uh, seem to have a bit of a problem with my camera. So unfortunately I cannot show my face while well, it's not much of a loss anyway <laughs> to everyone, but uh, uh, I will go directly into uh, my, I also have to share my screen. So I don't know if I can, uh, it seems that another screen is being shared right now. All right, I'll try to be very quick with this. I think, I think you may be seeing it now. Um, well, first of all, uh, thank you very much for the opportunity to join this uh, training and specifically this session, which is a very important session. Labor migration, as uh, as, as Theo said, is uh, is is something that is uh, quite uh, increasing in in importance and also in size. Uh, we know that migration in general. Uh, uh, is uh, is a phenomenon that uh, that uh, is as old as the world, and uh, that uh, is clearly not going to show any signs uh, of stopping anytime soon. Actually, quite the contrary, because we live uh, increasingly in a, in a global world. Uh, uh, very much in, in in agreement with every point that uh, uh, Theo mentioned. Uh, IOM uh, is, is very much in agreement uh, with, with with a lot of the the effort and the philosophies around labor migration and how to to better uh, tackle it for for for, for mutual benefits uh, for host countries, but also for for, for moving migrants, um, moving for the purpose of labor. Uh, from the IUM point of view, we also understand that, uh, you know, there, there are, I mean, by essence, uh, journalists uh, are uh, somewhat of researchers as well uh, in the effort of trying to cover various topics. Uh, it is, it requires 
uh, uh, members of the media to, to, to do a fair share of research. And sometimes it's not very easy uh, to find some of the elements that guiding elements, let's say, uh, uh, that could assist them with that, which is the purpose for, for such trainings as, as we are having now. Uh, so I would like to create some connectivities uh, for, 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 for the members of the media and the colleagues when it comes to uh, certain documents of importance to us, uh, that have probably already been mentioned uh, the previous days of this training, uh, one being uh, the Global uh, Compact on Migration, um, uh, the other one being the obvious uh, agenda, uh, the SDGs and the Agenda 2030, uh, and of course, uh, inserting within all this uh, the regional strategy for the SADC region that IOM has. Uh, uh, so uh, I hope, let me see if uh, I can... All right, uh, so I will start with the regional strategy that IOM has, and I'll be very brief, of course, because uh, we do not want to be redundant with uh, some of the important points that have already been mentioned by Theo uh, from the ILO point of view. Uh, but the regional, uh, IOM has a regional uh, strategy that has uh, 10 focus areas and objectives, and uh, within those 10 uh, focus areas, uh, two uh, focus uh, somewhat on labor migration. Uh, so this, uh, the first, the, the one that focuses solely on labor migration is focus area four, uh, which is to work towards well-managed labor migration that uh, benefits migrants and uh, uh, employers, and as well as the sustainable development uh, uh, of countries of origin and destination. And for your ease of reference, uh, I also put which, uh, sustainable development goals uh, these are uh, aligned with. And in this case is one, four, five, eight, and uh, 10. Uh, what basically that means, uh, and I've, I've written it out because this presentation was uh, shared a little bit late with, uh, with everyone. So but for ease of, of translation for, uh, for the translators, it's also written out right there on the screen. Uh, what this means is that IOM supports the development and implementation of labor migration policies uh, and or strategies at the subnational, national and regional levels in Southern Africa uh, to ensure that migrant workers are better protected and movements are better managed. Uh, of course, this is done uh, in collaboration with the SADEC, uh, the common market for Eastern and Southern Africa, that's COMESA, uh, and the Indian uh, Ocean Commission, uh, the IOC. Uh, member states. Uh, of course, the private sector as well, that always plays a key part. Uh, we, I mean, we're discussing labor migration here, uh, trade unions, and other related uh, stakeholders uh, through interstate and interregional frameworks governing South-South labor mobility. Um, the other focus area uh, that uh, touches up on labor migration um, is focus uh, area uh, one. Uh, I've put that one after the previous one because the previous one is solely focusing on labor migration, but this one basically speaks of promoting, tapping into the mutually reinforcing links between migration and development uh, for the benefit of countries of origin and destination, as well as migrants themselves. Uh, and once again, uh, highlighting the SDGs that this one uh, is aligned with. In this case, one, 10, 11, and 16. Uh, so this is really to give you a guide uh, and point the, the, the arrows uh, for you uh, towards some of the sources uh, that, that, that you can have when you decide uh, to focus on, uh, on, on, on labor migration and write stories and articles about it. Uh, and, and, and also for you to understand that the culture here is to indeed look at labor migration as mutually beneficial for not only the country that is receiving hosting, but also for the 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 the, the uh, for for the for the migrant, uh, the labor migrant uh, within the hosting country, and even uh, beneficial, you know, by way of remittances and other ways uh, to the to the country uh, to the the the, the, the departed uh, country. So this is this is a thought to also keep in mind when when covering some of the stories related to labor migration uh, within our regional strategy. This is more of a general manner of 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 looking at things. Uh, we have uh, um, 
three strategic priorities within the 10 objectives, and it's focused on resilience, mobility, and governance. And what is important to know here, and again, the connectivity uh, between uh, all these important documents uh, that are now uh, very public and accessible online, uh, 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 the, the importance is to promote a holistic approach uh, to migration governance at all levels, uh, uh, to leverage the implementation of the GCM, that is the Global Compact for Safe, Orderly and Regular Migration, uh, and uh, the 2030 Agenda, this is the, uh, the SDGs. Within the GCM document uh, that I mentioned, uh, as has probably been told to you already before, there are a total of 23, uh, uh, 23 objectives. And as you can see highlighted in red, uh, quite a few of them touch up uh, on, on, on labor migration. I will not go too much into details on them. Uh, I mean, uh, I think uh, uh, my colleague Tunde uh, is also present and perhaps uh, he will be part anyway of the conversations after my presentation and maybe some of these can be unpacked uh, a little better. But I highlighted those in red to make you understand that labor migration definitely has some kind of a cross-cutting uh, uh, dimension to it. And, and that is why it's important to, to unpack it uh, properly. Uh, I, I think I can skip this uh, this slide because it uh, touches upon something that you already know, which, has, which, which are the SDGs themselves. Uh, when it comes to IOM and, and our way to tackle it, we have uh, an initiative called the DISC initiative. Uh, it stands for Diversity, Inclusion, and Social Cohesion. Um, I think uh, those words are self-explanatory, but especially the, the last sets of terms there, social cohesion is something that uh, we have started to really emphasize and put a lot of importance on uh, uh, for, for because uh, even if we have to take the example of South Africa, for example, I mean, we're all fully aware of the occasional uh, challenges when it comes to, to uh, xenophobia, uh, which uh, really, really uh, underline um, uh, a bit of a, of a conflict, conflict of views uh, and, and emotions and opinions when it comes to, to the presence of non-South African uh, uh, foreign nationals or uh, uh, of, of many of various countries, not only of the region, but other uh, region of, of the continent. Um, so social cohesion uh, is becoming a, a, a topic of, of extreme importance uh, because it's within that that uh, we, 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 of course, try to uh, tone down, um, let's say, the root causes of, uh, of, 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 of xenophobia, or let's just say a uh, social discomfort uh, with, uh, with, with, with foreign national presence, uh, because we often, more often than not, uh, such sentiments come from um, lack of information and lack of knowledge. And, and, and that is why the emphasis on the mutual benefit of uh, labor migration uh, uh, is, 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 is embedded very deeply within this uh, DISC initiative. Um, so again, it's, it's explained here that uh, migrant integration is an essential component uh, of effective and comprehensive uh, migration management. Uh, so uh, this is an, an initiative that uh, for now from started in 2019 and extending into 2023. Uh, it's a strategic vision that highlights the importance of collaboration and community inclusion in effective migration management. Uh, and uh, integration is a cross-cutting and multi-sectoral issue that spans multiple policy areas, uh, and therefore IOM implements and supports uh, a wide range of services and interventions, which aim to support newcomers in all stages of the migration continuum while sensitizing host communities uh, to the benefits uh, of diverse societies. Um, I will not go into details, but uh, anyway, those um, presentations will be shared. But in these bullet, few bullet points are some of the activities of that uh, DISC initiative, which basically supports the point that I uh, the points that I just mentioned. Uh, number two, and lastly, uh, we have uh, what we call the bilateral labor migration agreements. Uh, which uh, are uh, neither a new policy instrument nor geographically uh, restricted, but uh, rather uh, they have been a preferred means of states to facilitate labor mobility, uh, starting from as early as the 20th century. Uh, so those agreements uh, popularity uh, have largely been owed uh, to its flexibility as well as ability to target 
specific groups or, uh, or needs to react to economic fluctuations and to share the responsibility for monitoring flows. Uh, so recent research uh, pointed that uh, substantive alignment gaps, there are alignment gaps between existing bilateral labor agreements and international standards uh, that have developed in the, the past decades. So IOM is working towards developing comprehensive global policy uh, guidance with, uh, on this bilateral labor uh, migration agreements. Uh, based on regional and international standards, uh, uh, interstate mobility agreements, and global compact uh, for migration as well. Um, and uh, lastly, uh, what we uh, believe as IOM uh, is that effective labor migration policies and programs are needed in order to, number one, respond uh, to labor market needs in origin uh, and destination countries, uh, that means facilitate uh, job and skills matching, uh, ensure the protection of migrant workers, tackle de-skilling brain drain, which is a term that I believe uh, all of us are familiar with, um, increase social returns on investment in education, facilitate uh, migrant workers integration in destination countries and reintegration to origin, uh, ensure that labor migration is harmonized uh, with employment and national development plans. Uh, of course, fight racism, xenophobia, stereotyping against migrant workers. Uh, evaluate the contribution of labor migration to development, uh, which is a very important uh, connecting point. And uh, finally, to contribute to the intersectoral mainstreaming uh, of migration. Uh, I will stop here. Thank you very much, Makungu and colleagues, uh, and uh, back to you. Okay, thank you. Uh, uh, thank you very much. And uh, now Makungu is going to, uh, to, to help us with the facilitation of our discussion. But before, I think we have also some words from uh, Vincent and Charles, right? Um, I think while Vincent and Charles are preparing themselves just to add on to um, the, the two presentations we received from Theo and Abibo, um, I'd just like the participants to start um, thinking with the last question that Theo left us with in terms of what are some of the challenges given the information you just heard around some of the key messages we would like to drive around reporting on, on, on migrant workers. What are some of the key challenges you find um, or you, you encounter daily when you, you, you're reporting on issues of migrant workers, um, whether it's racism, xenophobia, perspectives, stereotypes, um, or what are other questions that you have or would you like to know more about regarding migrant workers that can actually, when you leave here, can actually enhance your reporting to be fair and balanced around issues of migrant workers. Um, I've already seen some comments in the chat, Theo and Vincent um, uh, were kind enough to already drop those links for Tuliti to go explore some of the research um, and hopefully we'll receive a story from her around that very soon. Um, but yeah, I would like just to, to encourage the participants to feel free you know, to engage our experts who are present here to have a, a lively discussions. I mean, you all media people, you always, I think you always have questions and interesting questions, which I think could make such a, an amazing discussion this, this morning. So um, if, you, if you don't wanna drop your questions in the chat, you can raise your hand and we'll give you the floor to ask, um, give your inputs, ask the questions. But for now, um, I will just move over um, to Charles and Vincent to add any inputs they might have following those um, two presentations. Thank you. Thank you, Makongu. I see Ashok is raising his hand, so I'll give him the floor in just a second. Just wanted maybe to, to I think uh, uh, Theo and Abibo's presentation were, were quite, cl quite, quite clear, um, uh, but, but maybe one of the challenges we'd like to discuss with you is also how do we bring that back home to the specific locations where you're reporting from? And at times it can be a little bit um, difficult to connect um, let's say broader issues um, of global or, or regional perspective to the more um, daily work that you might have sometimes at the very local level. 
So don't hesitate to um, maybe share with us the reality of what labor migration is like, feels like, looks like in, in where you are, what you are accustomed to hearing, or also some of the concrete challenges that you might be facing. They might be access to sources of information. There might be some uh, linguistic challenges um, and we can really see how we can help you uh, find ways and strategies. Um, because at the end, in terms of messaging, um, I think the if, if we look at Theo's recommendation at the end of his presentation, the key messages that we would like to see or, or that are important to highlight, um, those are quite broad. And within these broad topics, we need to find very specific stories that illustrate these issues. And that's a little bit where the challenge is. Um, I don't necessarily think your audience would want uh, some very general uh, type of opinion or reporting on, uh, labor migration in the SADC region. Uh, but they'd more, most probably be interested in you identifying specific challenges in your community and connecting that with broader policy issues. Um, so that's just some ideas. And um, uh, Ashok, since your hand is raised, we're, we're pleased to hear you. Thank you. Thank you, Charles. Uh, can you hear me? We can hear you fine. Yes. I would like to share the situation in Mauritius. In Mauritius, where <clears throat> migrant workers, uh, workers coming from foreign countries, it has been, it has been a, a rising trend in Mauritius the last 10 or 15 years. It is a, it is a real phenomenon, we will say, in Mauritius, because uh, in the past we used to have uh, migrant workers only in the manufacturing sector, the textile industry. Now we have in almost every sector, construction, development of projects in the IT sector, in the financial sector, and migrant uh, workers come from many countries, mostly from Bangladesh, from India, from China, from Africa, even from Europe. The issue here is how do, how, how the local population, how, how, what is the reaction of the local population towards migrant workers? How to make the population accept that the migrant workers contribute to the development and to the economy and have their own rights? This is a real issue. And the second issue would be, would migrant workers have the, would they be able to claim for civil rights? They have rights as workers, of course, and this is, this is ensured in our legislation and various conventions we have signed. But what about civil rights? I mean, rights to, be, to form part of uh, trade unions, to participate in politics, or to, to get access to uh, naturalization or citizenship process. This is also a, a second issue. And for example, in Belarus, workers from Commonwealth countries. This is, this is under our constitution. Workers who come from Commonwealth countries and who have stayed here are working here for two or certain number of years. They can, they have the voting rights. They can participate in the election as voters. And the the third issue for me would be, we as journalists. Do we have to, to present a, a positive image of the migrant workers, or is it not, is it not more appropriate for us to, to, talk, to, to present, a, to project the real image as it is, whether it is negative or positive, whether, whether it is a good image or a bad image? What, 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 what is our responsibility as journalists? Thank you. Thank you, Ashok, for, for these three questions. I'm, I might start uh, giving some, some ideas and, and replying to your third question. And I, I'll invite uh, Theo, Abibo, and uh, Vincent to come in uh, maybe on the other aspects. Um, um, and, and, and I think that your question is very relevant. Um, 
it's kind of the challenge of this of this course. Um, and the way you present it is quite straightforward. You know, should we focus? Uh, it, it, I would rephrase it and say, should we present a distorted version of reality? If we're focusing exclusively on presenting a positive representation of migration, I think you're implying this in your, in your question, um, uh, you're presenting a distorted version of reality. Um, so I would not advise you uh, as a journalist uh, to present only one aspect of things or to consider to um, talk about migration only when you have a positive story to tell uh, because you would not be acting in a professional way. Um, you, you would be presenting uh, a partial version of reality. Uh, however, if we go back to, to Theo's presentation this morning, uh, we also have to acknowledge that most of the communication that is being done around labor migration uh, in the SADC region and elsewhere uh, tends to overemphasize negative aspects of labor migration. So we are seeing this for a number of, for a number of reasons. Uh, but we, when we look at, um, when we do media monitoring studies, um, so we look for a period of time, um, I've done this recently in several Arab states, we look at media production over a year, and we say, what is the typical framing of the reporting? We see that stories that associate uh, labor migrants with criminality, for example, uh, have the biggest share uh, of the reporting. Why is that? It often has to do with the type of sources of information who are considered for the reporting. The overwhelming majority, in this case, the study was done in Jordan and in Kuwait, but you would find these type of results elsewhere as well. The overwhelming sources of information who communicate on these issues are either local authorities or national authorities or member of political parties. Um, in this case, we found out that in more than 400 news segments over a year period, there was just two segments out of 400, which just included migrant workers as a source of information. So this is to tell you that we have a whole part of our society, here I'm taking the case of, of Jordan and Kuwait, but I'd be interested to look at Mauritius as well. We have a whole part of society who is here, who is contributing to the economy, but who is basically voiceless when it comes to hearing the concerns that they face and, and, and basically talking about the realities that they face. So I would not necessarily invite you, Ashok, to say, uh, let's just look at the positive aspect. Uh, but I would say uh, in Mauritius, who is talking about labor migration in the media? Who is producing the narrative? And is that produ production of narrative balanced in the voices that are here? That would be my first recommendation. My second recommendation would be to say, with regards to the main challenges that migrant workers can face with regards to access to their basic rights or to, um, let's say, enforcement of legislation, both national or international labor standards, for example. Can I find relevant stories uh, that um, illustrate challenges in this access? And can I bring that to my audience? So in doing that, you're not necessarily having a, 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 a partial distorted reporting. What you're doing is you are making an analysis of the situation. One example, you were talking about access to civil rights. Do migrant workers in a specific industry have access to form or join trade unions? Uh, in asking this question, 
you are not siding on positive or negative portrayal of migrant workers. You are saying, is the general public in Mauritius given sufficient fact, factual information to be able to understand why it is important that migrant workers have access to joining or forming trade unions and why the reality is different from that and why would it be important for us to maybe have some change? Maybe because Mauritius has ratified international labor standards that would oblige it to give access to, this, to these rights. Um, and so that's the type of communication and, and I would say media strategy that we would like to craft with you. Um, and, and when you do that, you're not uh, presenting yourself as an advocate of labor migration or I don't know what, what, what part of society. You are saying we need as a society to have information, factual quality information to be able to make informed collective decisions. Um, so I, I hope this helps you find the, the, the good way to go about it. Um, um, but, but the worst thing would be for you to, to go and try to find stories that fit an existing narrative. You have to identify challenges and then collect stories that show reality within the experience of migrant workers and, and other citizens in the society. Yeah, yeah, thank you, Charles, because basically uh, we are not advocate, advocacy journalists, and what you said is, is appropriate. It is the right perspective. Thank you. Um, thanks, Charles um, and um, Ashok. I see Theo has a hand. Um, Theo, you can come in. Thanks, uh, Makungu. And I hope we will be able to hear from uh, more participants. So I would just encourage uh, people to speak up also in line with what uh, Charles was saying earlier about the uh, local context. You know, what is the context of uh, uh, the, the discourse on migrants, migrant workers mm -hmm. in your country? So just share some of the information that would be useful, I think, for uh, for our session this uh, this morning as well. You know, do you feel you have to to fight negative perceptions from the outset, or is there more of a level playing field already available in the media? Are uh, perceptions uh, more or less neutral, or do you feel there is a negative? Uh, perception already in your country, or perhaps there is already a, neg a positive perception in uh, in your country. Um, I, I must say I must agree with what Charles was uh, was just presenting on uh, not to to get bogged down in, in uh, an a priori story about migrant workers. Obviously, we we do not want to present, you know, by definition, a positive image um, i think what is what is important and and i think this is in line with what uh, what charles is, is saying um uh, we we want a level playing field you know we want to 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 bring out factual information um and factual information for example about possibilities for migrants to get a proper voice similar to a non-migrant worker you know, uh, representation in a trade union. Is this possible for my migrant workers? Do they face particular challenges in uh, in your country? I think that is an, an important starting point for uh, for media messages. Just one or two things about what was uh, mentioned by Ashok in regard to uh, to Mauritius. Uh, in the context of the project, we are having uh, we will have an, a dialogue with uh, with Mauritius. 
uh, we, we already started uh, uh, that, that work. And part of the work that will be undertaken in, uh, in Mauritius is probably going to be some more factual information on the uh, contribution, the economic contribution of migrant workers in the, in the country. And I think if you have that sort of factual empirical information, uh, and if that is properly disseminated, uh, packaged in such a way that it is understandable for uh, the, the average uh, uh, non-expert, uh, then it, it might help you know, leveling the playing field also with regard to the perceptions uh, of migrant workers in uh, Mauritius. So not to project, the, the aim cannot be to project some uh, positive image that is not informed by actual information, by actual uh, research, but you should prevent a situation you know, that uh, negative perception is reinforced without any information um, either. So again, I think the, 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 the important message is that, that we would like to see an, uh, a level playing field, an open mind, um, and conveying messages that are based on facts and on, uh, on evidence. So hopefully there are some more stories that participants are willing to share about the, the, the media situation in their respective countries, the challenges they face in their uh, respective countries. And, and I have one, uh, one question in, uh, in particular that I, that I raised uh, uh, before. Do you feel you know, that you have to fight negative perceptions from the outset? Or is there a more open mind, a more level playing field with regard to migrant workers in, uh, in your country? Thanks, back to you, Makungu. Um, thank you so much, Theo. And, and I, I really agree with what Theo and um, Charles have mentioned, that we're not trying to make you pro-migrant workers or be, you know, one-sided. We just want to just change the perception because, as Charles mentioned, that usually in the media what we see, we see really one side um, which leans more to the negative side of reporting around issues on migration. So, um, we we'll really like to hear your stories and your particular challenges in your country in terms of what is the media landscape like around issues of migration, what are some of the issues you're encountering and how can we can discuss them further. I see there's a question from Nuruddin. Um, I will come back to the question. I'll just give Vincent now. I see he has a hand and then um, I will come back to Nuruddin's question and we can discuss his input. Thank you. Over to you, Vincent. Uh, thanks very much, Makungu, and good morning, everyone. Um, they, I, I'm finding this discussion particularly interesting because I think the, when, when we started last week on Monday, we were talking about the media uh, shaping public opinion, changing people's perceptions about uh, migrants in general and migrant workers in, in particular. Uh, and I think the, the kind of discussion we're having and the, the questions raised by Ashok actually points to a much bigger issue. Um, so it's not, it's not limited to the role of the media and what the media should do. And of course, that's what our discussion is about. Uh, but I think it's important to understand uh, what we're talking about in, in the bigger context about why it is so difficult actually to be telling different stories about migrants and, and about migration. So I briefly want to make three interrelated points. And then I want to just end off uh, with posing what I think is probably for, for most of the, uh, the media practitioners here is probably going to be one of the, the most fundamental challenges. Uh, Theo in, in his presentation talked about the need to uh, look at equality between migrant workers and between local workers. But here is where, where I think the difficulty starts. There's a major tension between what Theo talked about essentially as the inevitability of migration. So we see the numbers. Labor migration has increased over the years. It is likely to increase. So we make the point, uh, migration, labor migration is inevitable. It's going to happen whether we like it or not. So yes, we can agree on that. But that then runs into the difficulty that governments have the sovereign authority to make decisions about migration. So the position of governments by and large is 
we have the right to decide who comes to our country, for what purpose, how long they can stay and so on. So we immediately we run into that problem. Migration is a reality, it is inevitable, but governments have the authority to make decisions about migration, about who's allowed and so on. And so when we're trying uh, in media reporting, when we're trying to make this point about the inevitability of migration, we often get the response, while migration might be real, it might be a reality, but as government, we reserve the right to make these decisions. And that I think is, is one of the, uh, the difficulties that, that need to be dealt with is how do you deal with that? And it links to what I call citizen entitlement, right? Where citizens believe uh, and governments uh, either explicitly or implicitly uh, advocate this position. Citizens believe that they come first and governments will say, in fact, in a lot of uh, policies, governments use the, the, the phrase citizens first. And so you have this tension right at the beginning between migration as a reality in our countries and uh, the, the response of government in the sense of saying, well, whether it happens or not, we will still make our own decisions. And of course, they have the right and the authority to do so. What we're seeing in this, this uh, kind of broadens the challenge is in most SADC member states, even though there is an agreement uh, at the level of, of, of SADC that all member states should work towards uh, developing and implementing specifically a labor migration policy, only five or six uh, SADC member states actually have such a policy. Others are in the process of developing, they're debating it, they're consulting on it and, and, and so on. And so we actually see the absence of very clear policy directives on labor migration. And that contributes, I think, for many people uh, to the sense of confusion, because it makes it difficult to evaluate in the specific countries. It makes it difficult to evaluate what the rights and the entitlements of migrants are, because it is not anywhere, uh, it's not expressed explicitly anywhere. And what we find is that different government departments, different organizations, different individuals, they all make up their own minds about the rights and entitlements of migrants, migrant workers, because there are no uh, clear policy directors. And so we ask the question, uh, when we say migrant workers are being, uh, rights are being violated, uh, how do we know that? What is the policy? So we then revert to international labor standards, we, we revert to, internet, to other international instruments, but there's no real national policy that we can point to and say, here is an example. We may then generally refer to human rights laws as well, but the absence of specific direct policy that deals with labor migration uh, makes, it, makes it incredibly difficult to, to do that evaluation and to point to our government or as a society, we have agreed to certain things uh, uh, about the rights of migrant workers and now we are violating uh, those rights. And that then ties into my third point, which is also the point that, that Ashok had raised the other day and he raised it now again, which is that when we then start doing uh, more positive reporting, when we start telling more positive stories about uh, migrant workers, when we seem to be advocating, and I'm using the, the word in, in inverted commas, when we seem to be advocating for the rights of migrant workers, uh, we get accused of, you know, we are anti-citizens or we just want to promote the, the rights of migrant workers. But Theo's point about uh, achieving equality does require that we make extra efforts to protect the rights of migrant workers. Um, and so how do you balance that when we seem to be giving preference to migrant workers at the, the expense of local workers? Uh, and that then leads me to, to the, I don't know if it's a question or something that I just want the, the participants to consider, which is given that context, how do you, in writing about migration, how do you take these challenges into account? How do you respond to, to the reality, absence of policy, citizens who feel that they are being neglected and, and, and so on. And so if part of what we want to do is to promote a positive image of migration, understand that we're doing that already in the context of confusion and the context of uncertainty. Uh, and one of the things that we found, and this, uh, Ashok and, and Charles, this goes to the point you're making about providing factual information and balanced information. In the work that we've been doing um, around the rights of migrant workers, the response we often get from citizens is, 
Well, our minds are already made up. Don't confuse us with your facts and your information, right? So the more we're trying to say migrants create jobs, the more we're trying to say, well, actually migrants have these rights, the response we're getting from citizens is, we really don't care what you're telling us. We've already made up our minds. And that for me, in, in telling stories about migration, is probably the most fundamental challenge, right? Because the way we, we usually tell the stories is we're balancing uh, the rights and entitlements of migrants. We're advocating for the rights of migrants in a context where people have already made up their minds. And so if we keep blowing the trumpet of migration is good for us, migrants create jobs, migration contributes to our economy, we're probably, in my view, we're probably not going to get very far, right? And so what we have to do is tell the migrant stories at the same time as we're telling the citizen stories. Right? Because if it seems to be we, we, we're giving preference to one group at the expense of the other group, we're not going to get very far. And the question is, how do you put those things together? How do you demonstrate that migrants and citizens together contribute to the economy? Right? Migrants and citizens together create a better society. And just very quickly, uh, what we did, uh, we started doing what we called anti-xenophobia training. This was many years ago. And the kind of response we got from citizens when we invited them to attend anti-xenophobia workshops, uh, the response was generally, are you telling us we are xenophobic? We are not xenophobic. So there was a lot of denial about that, right? And the more we were talking about, we must treat migrants better, we must respect the rights of migrants, the more negative citizens actually became. They were saying, but if we do this, then it's a problem because if you give these rights to migrants, you're taking it away from us. Our strategy was then to, instead of talking about anti-xenophobia training, which we were doing with citizens, we developed a human rights program, right? And the human rights program was where we were then bringing citizens and the migrants together and, and refugees as well. We were putting them in the same room and we were talking to them about what are the rights of all the citizens or all the people living in the country? What are the specific rights of refugees? What are the specific rights of migrants? The response of citizens to that was, now we understand that by giving migrants or refugees particular rights doesn't take away from the rights that we all have. And I think just in reporting on, on, on migration and on, uh, on migrant workers, we cannot do that in isolation from the context the point Charles was making. What is the context within which we're working? Uh, and how do we make sure that we don't seem to be challenging the views of citizens we active, we in fact are doing that. That's what we're actually doing. But we cannot be uh, conveying the message to citizens that you are bad. Well, you shouldn't believe these things because the moment that citizens get that impression or anyone else gets that impression, their reaction is going to be a negative one. And so the challenge I think for media practitioners is how do you deal with this belief that people have contrary to in the information that we might provide? How do you, do, do you deal with the fact that people hold on to their perceptions and their opinions? And it's very rare, I would say, that by providing alternative information about migration, that we're actually going to change people's minds uh, because they're just going to dismiss the information. So, while it's fine for you to tell us that migrant, migrants create jobs, we might believe it, but the fact that we, we hear that this is the fact doesn't change what we believe about migrants. And I think, I'd, I'd like to hear comments from, from the participants about how do you deal with changing people's perceptions when you know those perceptions are not grounded in reality, but when you then provide the, the factual information and the reality, people actually go deeper into their perceptions. They, they, the reaction is negative rather than that they are being persuaded. So it's, don't, don't confuse us with your facts, right? And in fact, what does that mean? And then when I'm using the words, but that's how people have reacted to the work that we've been trying to do. It's like, we don't care about your facts. You're just confusing us. We believe these things regardless of what the facts are. And that I think when, when thinking about reporting on migration is how do you deal with that? Um, how do you influence people's ideas and perceptions uh, uh, when, when there's such entrenched opinions and there's such entrenched viewpoints that uh, that simply reporting on international labor standards or simply reporting on 
when you've done a study, migrants create so many jobs and so on, is actually not really going to make much of a difference. I'm not suggesting that we should not do things, go do those things. I think we have to report on those things as well. But I'm saying understand the context uh, and how you, <laughs> we have to develop an approach that takes into account that simply providing better and good information is probably not going to make much of a difference. Thank you so much, Vincent, for your inputs. And I like the, the, the part you kept highlighting that when you do such research and engagements, it does this um, comment about why are you confusing us with your facts? And I think um, Theo maybe might be very useful to the last question, which I'll come to um, from Jane um, around, like Theo did a research in South Africa um, around migrants contributing to the economy. Um, and, and then that question, which we'll get to after those two comments around how the local um, South Africans feel like they were part, they were creating the jobs, but now they're taken, you know. So the, 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 the separation of what is facts and what is the reality or the perception of, of the ordinary citizens on the ground. But before coming to that, um, I would like to, um, I think there's two comments from Nurdin, who's based in Cape Town, and she works for a community media. She usually writes on stories around migration, both for print and radio. And she says that one of the challenges she has um, is consistency of stories. And she thinks this training is helping um, with providing those resources. Um, she also asked if experts will be available, available beyond this training to provide more information about issues, um, say on radio and print around World Refugee Day um, or Heritage Day. Um, just to answer, I think if any other experts wanna come in, they can. But um, we are available. The aim of the training was to actually capacitate you and to give you the resources that you might need to go back and, and you know, create the stories and write stories with information and facts and, and, and useful documentation that can assist in having a balanced um, and fair reporting on issues on migration. Um, and beyond this training, yes, the experts will be available. ILO and IOM will always be available um, to, to assist where you have questions or to engage them around any sources or stories you are pursuing. And just to also highlight to all the participants that as part of the training, if you go through the concept note, you realize that in phase three, we have asked the participants to go and write stories. After those two weeks of engagement and training and getting all the information, we, we are asking participants to go write stories or produce short um, feature for radios or TV, or whatever form of media you, you work in. Um, and there will be coaches available in the two weeks that you'll be given to produce the stories. So I think even in those two weeks, you can still engage um, the experts. And even beyond that, ILO and IOM, um, and the same project remains available to assist and to help you with any questions or, or having any interviews scheduled. And then the other comment was from Tupeyo Muleya, um, who is based um, at the border of Zimbabwe in South Africa. And, she's, and they say that they report more on migration related issues. Uh, they currently ask for context that will be provided um, for, for you to be able to enrich your news articles. Um, going further. Um, and then she also raises an issue around abuse of undocumented migrant workers um, has been on for more than a decade. I want to find out from experts and hear how best the migrants may be assisted. The abuse is common during deportation or underpayment. So before going to the, to the, to the next question, I'll just open the floor to our experts to, to respond to what um, Tupeo is raising around how best and they can assist migrants whom they see are being abused during either deportation or um, uh, abused by under, being underpaid in their particular um, work. So Charles, um, Theo and, and, and Vincent, whoever wants to give it a go can go. Thank you. Maybe I can, uh, I can start, uh, Makungu. Yes, you can, Theo, go ahead. Right, thanks. Um, just to uh, pick up on one or two points um, raised by, uh, by Vincent, 
which I think were uh, were very very important. And um, I I would like to to also see you know if uh, if there are some some perceptions some some views of uh, of participants with regards to this uh, to this. Uh, this one one of the things he is, is he was saying is um, that uh, there's there are people you know whom you can you can give facts and and figures, but they will all only say ah don't confuse me with your facts and figures you know I've made up my mind I'm not going to to change my uh, my mind. Of course this happens. Um, it happens with regard to uh, perceptions of. Uh, of, of people of, of migrant workers. I would also so it happens with regard to politics in general. Um, people vote for a certain party, people have an, uh, an, an su supporting a, an, a certain party. No matter what other parties are going to say, they will still vote for their party and it is not going to change. But at the same at the same time, you see time and again in politics uh, landslide victories of a certain uh, certain party, suggesting that it is an important part of the of the electorate that actually does change their uh, their mind. You know, is basically sitting on the fence and is monitoring the information and what comes out of uh, political parties. And I think it is the same with, with regard to, to, to migrant, uh, to perceptions with regard to, to uh, migration. Some people surely will never change their, their mind, but there is another group that will uh, be open to uh, uh, facts and information. And I think that is the, the major group that is, that is the target group for, uh, for the, the, the media in that, uh, in that sense. Uh, if you want to, to bring across new information. Um, the people who have, have set their mind and are never going to, uh, to change, uh, I, I think they, they are there, but I'm not so sure you know, if this is an, uh, an, an, a very large group. I like to believe that uh, there is quite an important group that is, that is willing to, uh, to read new information and absorb new, uh, new information. Um, including from uh, from media uh, reports, so I, I hope there's a, there's a way forward there with regards to abuse of uh, migrants or migrant workers in in a certain uh, situation. I think there is a major role for the media uh, to play by just reporting, you know, giving an honest report of what you see, what you hear. Um, what you are able to, to gather in terms of, uh, of information. Um, if it is brought about in the, in the media, if it is discussed in the media, this can be an important reason for authorities to launch an investigation, to try to improve uh, the planning, to try to, to do things in, an, uh, in a better way. And it has also an important role for international organizations that ILO is working obviously with employers and, and workers organizations. If a workers organization is reporting certain issues, you know, and I think the, the, the starting point would be a workers organization. First, bring it to the attention to a workers organization. But the workers organization in turn can also bring issues to the attention of the uh, of the ILO that it is even discussed at the international level and then just the exposure the fact that certain issues are being discussed can be a major uh, positive engine of, of change because uh, it is much easier to abuse if nobody is watching than if things come out of the in the in the open and are being discussed uh, even without accusing anybody in uh, in particular, just uh, raising certain uh, certain issues can already be extremely uh, helpful. And I think there is an, a major role for the for the media, just in terms of uh, of reporting. And this is this is true, I think, with regard to uh, to migrant workers, but also with uh, with regard to the world of work in general. You know, there is an, an important role for the media to expose, you know, what is uh, what is going wrong. Thanks. Let me leave it 
uh, here for the moment. Back to you, Makungu. Thanks. Um, thanks, Dio, for that. Um, any other comments from our experts? If not, I think I can just go to the second question um, by Jane Rabutata. She says, using South Africa as an example, where social cohesion or lack thereof between South Africans and migrants is often on the spotlight in SEDEC. How can the media best report on the value of economic migrants um, to citizens who generally feel they are being robbed of employment opportunities, especially in townships where you find um, that a majority of what we call spaza shops, so this is like um, small shops in, in the locations, um, are owned by migrants and locals argue that they have had to close their shops because those owned by migrants have prices that are difficult to compete with. What is the best way to report on that? If I, as a journalist, get into a township and even with just observation, I do not see South African owned shops, yet a majority of them are employed, are not employed and struggling to start businesses or keep them running. So that's the question. I will open it up for um, discussions and some inputs from our, our, our experts and, and even participants. You can feel free to raise your hand and engage in any of these questions um, and share your inputs. Thank you. So any um, anyone can give it a go. Yes, you may, uh, Vincent. Uh, let, let me use the question asked by Jane as actually a typical example of, of what I was talking about earlier, right? Um, so, yes, a lot of complaints by uh, uh, South Africans in, in the local townships uh, that uh, foreigners are taking away their business opportunities and are undermining them. So a colleague of mine uh, did some research into this and concluded, while that actually uh, the, the phenomenon or the more large-scale phenomenon of spaza shops in the township was actually started by foreigners. So, uh, she did a, a kind of historical analysis of spaza shops and whatever, and said, and basically said to citizens, well, actually, a lot of this was initiated by foreigners, right? And so uh, you weren't doing this before. It was only when foreigners started doing it that you started jumping into, uh, jumping on the, the, the bandwagon. Now, as far as she was concerned, this was factual information. And the response of locals was, we don't care that they started at first. We now know there's a business opportunity. We, they are taking it away from us. So that didn't, that wasn't particularly successful in persuading people to change their minds. There was then another project that actually said, okay, we understand your concerns that your, your own shops are not doing so well, that you feel that uh, opportunities are being taken away from you. We then arranged for what we call skill sharing. Uh, between foreign business, small business owners, shop owners, and local business people who wanted to start their own business. And so the foreign news was actually training uh, local people to help them set up their shop. They started working as a collective because effectively in a lot of the townships, the reason why the, the small foreign owned shops are so successful is because they collaborate, they work together. Right? Um, and so when we started doing that kind of training and then started reporting on this, which is everyone is being successful now, right? So it's not citizens against foreigners, uh, but everyone, because they're working together, they're collaborating, everyone is being successful. But what had to go into that was not just a report on what the facts were, but an analysis of why things were not working, why things were so difficult, why were uh, local business people not succeeding, whereas foreign business people were succeeding. The conclusion out of that analysis was, uh, it would be helpful if you actually work together. And so the point I was making earlier, in addition to presenting just the facts and the information, we also have to help people understand and analyze the value of the information that we're presenting. It's not good enough to just say, boom, this is what we know. This is what we know, and this is why this is good for us, or this is why it's a benefit. So the analysis that accompanies the factual information, the statistics, and so on, is I think what helps, the point here was making, is what will help people change their minds, right? Um, and so the mistake that we made earlier, um, years ago, when we started doing this work, we thought simply providing alternative information is sufficient. We then said, well, actually, you cannot just provide alternative information. You also have to help, you also have to analyze this information and demonstrate how this is actually making a difference. So the analysis that goes with the factual information 
is, is critically important as well, because that I think is how you change people's minds and change their perceptions, because they, they can see how the information you're providing actually uh, leads, leads you to, become, to coming to a, a different conclusion or a different understanding. And it's not automatic. Simply saying foreigners or migrants create jobs is not helpful. You actually have to say migrants create jobs and this is the difference that it makes. This is how it benefits uh, your, your own citizens and so on. Um, thank you so much, Vincent, for, for your question. And I hope um, Jane has been answered. Um, I'm just checking if any other colleague would want to come in and add inputs on that. Um, that question, or is it sufficiently answered and we can move to, to the next one? Uh, okay, it seems like we, we are covered on that one. I'll just go to the question by Esengala. Um, They say that I'm based in Zimbabwe's second largest city, and my worry is on the issue of free, of free movement of persons protocol by the AU which according to one presentation out of 32 AU member states, only four countries have ratified it. Also, my concern is on the CEDEC free movement of persons protocol, which according to a presentation out of the 16 member states, only six countries have ratified. My question is, how best can the media pressure the member states to ratify the protocols and how the citizens in the member states can as well be assisted by the media to write on the protocols um, to their benefit. Um, that is the question um, posed um, by Esengala. So I'll just um, ask any, any one of our experts to come in with, with, their quest, with their inputs on that. Yeah, I can say a few words, uh, Makungu. Yes, you may see. Thanks, thank you. And it, it goes back to one of the issues I raised in the uh, presentation I made at the, uh, at the beginning. I think both at the level of the Africa Union and at the level of, uh, of SADC, certain commitments have been, uh, been made which are not necessarily in line, you know, what is happening in the, in the countries. And these protocols, I think, are, are, are very good examples in that, uh, in, in that regard, that countries are still struggling at the national level, you know, to fully absorb what has been agreed already at the uh, international level. And it has to do, I think, with an, 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 a number of, uh, of issues. One is that uh, some countries are, are trying to put the right uh, policies in place. Uh, as I mentioned, a number uh, are working also under international commitments on the, the development, the formulation, uh, and also the implementation of uh, labor migration policies. And the policy environment is, is not yet there to implement uh, these uh, international uh, protocols. Um, so there, I think there are certain, certain uh, bureaucratic and, and, and rules and regulations you know, that have to be adjusted before countries can make the, the next step. It can also be that countries uh, face uh, domestic opposition you know, political opposition against the, the ratification of certain uh, instruments. Obviously, it is, a, it is a political process which has to play out in, uh, in each uh, country. Um, I, I also think, you know, not all countries are aware, you know, of what the research is showing with regard to the benefits and the potential for uh, migration to benefit the uh, the, the, the economy, uh, that, that empirical research you know, on, the, on the effects of migration is not necessarily you know, fully, uh, uh, not, not necessarily all politicians are fully familiar with that and may fight you know, a, a political battle to, to uh, convince other uh, parties or their own party, uh, for that uh, for that matter, to to familiarize themselves with the uh, the uh, the results of uh, available research. One one under um, 
one one aspect of that research which which does not uh, always get the attention uh, de deserves, and I think Vincent Vincent was uh, also hinting at at the same, is the the impact of of migration in terms of innovation. There's a lot of research showing you know the the, the effects of uh, the spread of innovation, the spread of ideas that is associated with uh, migration. Certain ideas that are developed in one country, you know, and are taken by migrant communities to another uh, country uh, by, uh, by virtue of the fact that there is physical migration between uh, the countries. And a number of countries, uh, of course, have, have training programs in place to make sure that uh, local populations are actually benefiting from the skills and expertise that is brought by uh, migrants, which, which is another you know, major area for uh, benefit for countries of destination from uh, migration flows. So I, th I think that is that these are important areas to to highlight uh, in the in the media and the the, the broader uh, results of research in this in this area, as I say, are often not well known and not well understood. And these are major instruments, I think, to to forward the uh, the agenda on uh, migration in the in the region both in sadic and at the, the level of the of the continent thanks um thank you theo for for your inputs and and i agree with what um theo and and both vincent have raised that um sharing this information, sometimes the information is just not there or people are not aware of it. Um, and we really hope that this training will, will be one of those tools that are, are useful to you or have been useful to you as a way of capacitating you um, and now to have broader um, insight and also access to information that we can then use um, to, to take out to, to the media, to the communities um, and, and that, that we have. Um, I think um, if I don't see any other question in, in the chat box, if you have any last questions before we, we wrap up our session for today, you can either raise your hand or drop it in the chat. Um, and I'll also ask Abibo or Tunde if they have anything else they want to add um, from, um, from the discussion that we are having um, around, around this topic. Um, Oh, this will be the time where they can come in and add um, some inputs or remarks. And yeah, in the last part, we'll just ask Charles to maybe give just an overview, a wrap up in terms of some key messages that we can take away today um, around reporting on, on, on migrant workers in the medium and the key media messages we'd wanna see um, in the media landscape around um, issues on migrant workers. Um, Abibo has his hand. Um, Abibo, you can you can come in and give your remarks. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Makungu, and thank you very much, colleagues and all participants. Uh, I think uh, from my end is uh, just to uh, reiterate that uh, this is very much uh, the, the the opportunity for the beginning of a relation. Uh, between um, ourselves, our organizations, but also the member of the members of the media. Uh, so going back to the question about uh, some of our experts being available uh, here onward, um, I mean, all, all capital letters, uh, yes, as an answer, uh, definitely encouraged as well. Uh, this is the opportunity to connect the dots and to better to help each other, uh, number one, better understand the salient issues, but number two, also to to understand what how to better package uh, 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 some of the facts uh, so that uh, they are also more, uh, let's say, digestible. Uh, for, for you as media pr practitioners, uh, so that the public can also get accuracy um, in, in, in the way uh, things are communicated and disseminated. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Abib. And yes, like I'm also going to just stamp on that um, yes in Kep's log that we really want the media to be your partner and want to build strong relations with the media in. Oh. In, in spreading the positive work around migration and that both uh, the different agencies is doing and what we are doing as a collective under the umbrella of the SAM project. So yes, we, 
We really see the media as a critical uh, partner and stakeholder in the work that we are doing um, as, as, the same, as the same project. Um, now I'll just ask Charles to give us um, some overall remarks of some of the key messages that we can take away um, from today's session before we close. Over Thank to you, you, Charles. Thank you, Makungu. And uh, I mean, listening to, to what both Abibo and yourself were saying, um, uh, it reminds me, you know, of, of the power of collaboration and of diverse backgrounds. Uh, uh, and, you know, just the fact um, the SAM project, this unique cooperation between um, different uh, UN agencies for which it might be much, much simpler at times to work, you know, by themselves and as isolated and and not try to cooperate with uh, uh, people that are outside of the organization. Well, uh, we, we can see that um, when there are diverse backgrounds in the room, diverse areas of expertise, uh, it can lead to more, more powerful cooperation. And I think that's, that's also kind of the uh, underlying message here, what we need to um, uh, understand and illustrate. Um, in some of the key messages that I take from, from this session, if we go back to the first presentation by Theo this morning, um, labor migration is, is something that is here um, and it's something that is here to stay. Uh, and it is um, not necessarily something to perceive as a challenge or as something positive, it's a reality. It's part of the reality. Uh, and, and our challenge is to make sure that um, uh, we um, include this part of reality in our, in our daily reporting, in our daily communication. Um, I think one important comment from Vincent, from his experience and some of the stories he shared, is this idea that we should not be uh, singling out um, uh, communities. And because when we do that, at times we oppose them. Uh, and, and part of the problem that we're facing right now is this constant uh, opposition of uh, communities. Uh, and here I, I, I think the vaccine, for example, the vaccine rollout was, was something very interesting to look at. We saw a number of countries who are used to having policies which tend to exclude migrants from public policies, uh, uh, trying to, to understand how they would do with this vaccine because they, 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 they came to, to, to understand that if you're vaccinating just part of your population, you're not uh, answering the problem. So really looking at society as a, as a whole. Um, it appears to me from the questions also uh, that there is this um, uh, request or, or, or yeah, a request from, from some of the journalists or the communicators in the room to have easier access to uh, local expertise. Um, I'd like to, to have you thinking, uh, of course, of how you can have better access to, to, to existing expertise, but also how you can be an expert for others who are in the room. I think that's, that's the, the idea behind any type of regional project, looking at an issue over several countries here, we're looking at it from a quite a broad regional perspective. Um, um, last week in a presentation, I was um, suggesting the idea for some of you to, to, to specialize or to um, yeah, uh, invest uh, a little bit of time and energy in making sure that you have a good understanding, overall understanding of these issues. I hope that the presentations we've had last week and, and today have um, um, suggested to you how interesting it is to um, improve your expertise on these issues. As you do that, um, you will most probably become a source of expertise. Um, and I, I don't doubt what uh, Abibu and, and Makungu have said and that themselves or their future colleagues will always be available um, to provide some insights. And I think all of the resources that have been shared in the chat box are public resources that are already accessible. What, what the experts in the room are doing, they're only uh, giving you a quicker access to these resources, but they're already there. 
uh, what, what's key, I think, in the future is also how you, as members of a community of practice, as journalists, communicators, can um, just use the, the power of, of these instruments that we're using right now um, to improve your, your reporting, um, your access to stories, um, and also, I think what's very important, and we're not seeing that much currently, is to add depth and uh, cross-border uh, dimensions to your stories. It's much easier uh, for, for, for journalists from, from two countries to report on migration flows from these two countries than it is for, for, for one person to do it individually. Um, and it's actually sometimes more impactful for readers from both sides of the migration flow or the border um, to read the same story uh, than it is at time just to, to deliver it to one, one audience. Uh, and that I think is an invitation for you to kind of revisit the way uh, that you produce um, your content. Uh, and more importantly, revisit the way that you deliver your content uh, to your audience and to new audiences as well. Um, we're living in a time where the world of information is, is constantly being challenged. Um, it, can, it can be a bit frightening at times, <laughs> um, but it's also a place where there is a lot of opportunities. Um, so I really hope that through this um, uh, two-week course, not only do you raise your, your, your level of expertise, but maybe um, with the participants who are here in the room, in the chat box, and who are sharing their experience, you can identify contacts with which you can craft new uh, interesting stories. Um, so yeah, that, that would be about it uh, uh, for the key messages, but uh, thanks for uh, the experts, of course, for, for their time and their expertise, but also thanks to all of you who participated very actively today. It was a real, uh, real pleasure. Thank you. Thank you, Charles and Tias. Um, thank you very much to all our experts, Theo, Vincent, Charles, Abibo, um, for availing your time. Um, and giving us such insightful inputs today. And to our participants, thank you very much for such for engaging us, you know, for sharing your questions and giving your inputs as well. I'd really make the session lively and engaging for all of us. Um, and just to also reiterate what Charles mentioned about collaboration and working together. I'm sure when I hand back over to Fernando, he can better explain the platform and how it's run. But we do have a virtual um, coffee lounge on the e-platform where you can not only ask questions to our, to our experts, but can also engage you know, the fellow participants and have communication with them, exchange contacts, share ideas on how to collaborate on stories, particularly on those countries which have such close relation in terms of one being a sending country and another being a receiving country. So you could really come up with an amazing story um, around issues of migration that you both are facing in those two countries together. So I really do encourage all our participants that even after our two hour sessions are over, you have access to the e-platform um, throughout the day and, and every other time. Um, to visit, to ask questions. And if you didn't, were not able to send your questions today, you can still share them on the, on the virtual coffee station and we'll be able to, to, to get back um, with some responses to your questions. Um, and just to say thank you again for, for joining us today. Um, our, I think our next session is on Wednesday and on that session we'll be focusing specifically on irregular um, migration and trafficking in persons and smuggling of migrants. So today the focus was more on labor migration um, around uh, decent work around migrants who move um, for reasons of, of labor and work related. But on Wednesday, we're gonna be discussing issues of trafficking and smuggling of migrants. It will be um, facilitated by the UNODC, um, the United Nations Office on Drugs and Crime, will be present to answer all your questions and to engage you on issues around trafficking and smuggling of migrants. From myself, thank you very much for joining us today. Um, and I'll hand back over to, to Fernando for his final remarks. Thank you. Over thank to you very Fernando. much, Makungo.
Uh, actually, since you mentioned the forum on the campus, so I'm going to share my screen for one minute and, and show participants once again where exactly the forum is, if uh, anyone has any doubt still about that. Uh, it's always worth uh, to, to have a look at it again. So uh, I guess you are seeing my screen, right? Uh, and uh, so this is the, the campus uh, main uh, control panel. So when you log in, you, you come to the course and you come to this page. And basically what you have to do is to go to the block that corresponds to, to our course, the media training course, this one here. You click on the block and uh, uh, here is our virtual coffee place. And just to remind you also, if you go here to the sessions, you are going to find the records and presentations from the previous sessions, but when you go here to the virtual coffee place, so here uh, you have our our forum. You go here to our discussion topic, and here you can you can post and 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 reply to to the comments from other people. So this is the place where we can keep uh, our conversation alive. Uh, uh, by text, so uh, it's always worth uh, to 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 come here and to see what's happening. So, uh, and with that, I think we got to the end of today's session. So, thank you very much to all the speakers and to participants, to the interpreters. And as Makungo has mentioned, our next session is going to be on Wednesday at eight thirty. So, I wish you all a very good week and see you on Wednesday. Bye bye. Thanks, everyone.